Hi everyone and welcome back to the health and wellness for older adults course. This is lesson two and today we're going to be looking at biological and aging theories of longevity. Let's dive right in. So um, some of the goals of what we're going to discuss in this lecture will be some of the biological theories of aging. We're going to look at lifespan and life expectancy. We're going to look at different factors that will affect the aging process and the social and the roles of social class and how that affects aging as well and the biological aspect of aging. So let's Okay, so first we're going to look at the difference between lifespan and life expectancy. Okay, so uh, well, first I should go ahead and let's let's mention a little something about aging. So aging, as the aging process goes, because we start aging as soon as we're born, right? And as we age, we have changes in our organ tissues and cells. Um, all our vital organs will begin to lose some function or weaken as we move through um, adulthood, as we age and we move through adulthood. And um, so all this occurs in all of our body cells, tissues, organs, and these changes are, um, these changes are affecting our body systems from birth up until the end. Okay. So we are going to be going through a variety of different changes throughout our life. Okay. We notice a lot of this when we start to age more dramatically, I guess, um, when we become more older adults, especially in 65 and older and whatnot. But I mean, we've been, we've been aging since we were born. Okay. So anyway, let's look at the difference between lifespan and life expectancy. Okay. So lifespan, this it, okay, well, both terms lifespan and life expectancy, they both relate to the number of living years that an individual has, right? Um, they actually define two totally different concepts though. Okay, so lifespan is going to refer to the maximum number of years that an individual can, um, can live, has the potential to live. Okay, so theoretically, this is like the amount of life that we can potentially have. Okay, all right, so lifespan for us humans would be about 115, 120 years. Okay, but um, throughout the process of aging, there are a lot of different factors that kind of get in the way and contribute to our actual life expectancy. Okay, so the life expectancy is the number of, of years an individual can expect to live. Okay. So life expectancy. Um, so we have over time, we've, um, actually grown our life expectancy. It has increased over the years before back a hundred years ago. Um, our life expectancy was not nearly as high as it is today. So we are moving on up. Um, and there are a lot of variations from country to country as well. Right. Um, like we mentioned in our last lecture, the United States actually has the highest life expectancy where we can expect to live, I believe it was 79 years, I think. And as compared to other countries, it, it might not be as high, okay? Other, every other country is gonna, it's gonna vary, okay? It's gonna vary between groups, it's gonna vary between, um, you know, different cultures and whatnot. And there are a lot of, different factors that affect our life expectancy. Okay, a lot of different factors that contribute to what our life expect, um, what, to make our life expectancy what it is, okay? 
Um, a huge thing, a huge factor would be morbidity. Morbidity is the period of reduced function, disability, and illness. Basically, morbidity is disease, okay? Morbidity contributes a lot to our life expectancy. Okay, so factors influencing longevity. These, this is actually a different, a whole list of um, different ways that we can study the factors that are influencing longevity, okay? So actuarial data, these are statistics, okay? These are st stats that are being used to calculate various um, risk factors, okay? So they'll be calculating the various risk, risk factors that are known to be, um, to influence our longevity, all right? And then we have animal studies, okay? So this is a growing um, interest that many researchers have where they're comparing or yeah there's they're um, creating a lot of complex different studies to look at where they compare humans to our animal counterparts and we're figuring things out figuring looking at a lot of different factors that have to do with aging in them and in us and we're comparing and contrasting and you know figuring stuff out there then we have longitudinal studies so these are those studies that employ like a long, continuous, repeated measures, okay, to follow certain particular individuals throughout like a really long period of time, like years and decades, okay? These are studies where maybe there are certain participants who agree to participate in the study and they're just, the researchers are just following them, like maybe throughout like a whole decade or years or just, um, you know, to and to figure things out and watch how they're aging and how certain factors are affecting them and whatnot, right? Then we have centenarian studies. Centenarian studies are really cool. So centenarians are those who reach, who live to age 100 or higher, right? And some researchers do believe that many centurions actually have genes that um, that protect them from disease into old age, or they um, may have genes that allow them to repair damaged cells more or something. So a lot of these centurions, uh, many researchers are researching centenarians to try to figure out exactly what do they have that makes them different from everyone else. Because only, um, there are only, let me see how many, the, out of every 10,000 people in the United States, there are only 100, or only one individual out of every 10,000, sorry, um, people will reach the age of 100. Okay, so that's pretty remarkable. And I think that it's, it's a worthy study, right? So anyways, now looking at heredity. So heredity can come from many times, we usually think of heredity as coming from our genetics. Okay, so our DNA, whatever is included in our DNA, that is going to be what is passed on. Okay, but really hereditary is what is passed on to your offspring. And many times it's not necessarily your genetic information. It can also be your parenting styles and whatever you, uh, how you raised your children and whatnot. So that can, that will be passed on to your offspring and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so some parenting styles might incorporate diet, activity level, stress management, and you're going to um, pass that stuff on to your kids. Okay, so they'll inherit that from you. Then there's gender. Okay, so generally, and I think it's kind of common knowledge, um, females tend to live longer than males. Okay, so the average life expectancy in the United States for males is 75.4, and then for females, it's 80.4, 
Okay, so females typically live about five years longer than males. Okay, um, why is that? Uh, many people might say it's not necessarily genetic. It could be, well, it, it might be genetic, um, but uh, men tend to be more involved in risky behavior. Um, for example, maybe men might not necessarily go to see a doctor when they know something is wrong. They'll just tough it out. And then, um, you know, further down the road, it could get way worse. Okay. And that will contribute to more deterioration in their organ systems and all that. Uh, whereas a females, females are tend to try to fix what's wrong with them right away. You know, as soon as you find out there's definitely something wrong with me, um, we might go to the hospital or to see a physician or check things online. We're going to try to figure out what is wrong with us and get it fixed before something happens, before it gets worse. Okay, so that's, um, that's just something that we generally tend to do, but that also might be thought of as a stereotype as well. So I don't want to necessarily keep reinforcing those ideas on um, to people. But also there could be hormonal influences as well. Okay, so hormonally, we, we have different parts. We have different um, hormones that we're secreting. Um, so that also might have a, um, some impact, some influence on how we age and how we live our lives and, you know, things that we do. So, okay, so race and ethnicity. Here we are. Um, this is difficult to research in America um, because we don't necessarily have all the information. Okay, a lot of people aren't necessarily providing that information. Um, many people, me included, um, I don't necessarily like to click which group I believe I fit into. So um, <laughs> that is hard to keep track of in America. But, um, and then there are a lot of socioeconomic factors that are tied to race and ethnicity in the United States. So, first of all, minority is the non-white population. It typically tends to be um, poor, less educated, have a poor living situation. They might not have insurance. They might have less insurance, less benefits. Um, they probably don't have the best diet. They might not be taking care of themselves very well. They tend to not have great jobs or wonderful sources of income. Um, there might not be too much stability there compared to their white counterparts. Um, a lot of minorities face, and it's because of all of these other factors, but because of that, they're probably facing higher, much higher stress levels and a lot of discrimination in this country. And that's definitely going to take a huge toll on the health and well-being of these people. Okay, cigarette smoking. So this is the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. Okay, men, uh, when, when they smoke cigarettes habitually, will tend to lose around 13.2 years off of their life. Women, a little bit more, 14.5 years off of their life. Um, <clears throat> so in older people, what happened? Well, let me just say something else here first. Um, the nicotine in cigarettes, it, what it does is it causes the narrowing of the blood vessels in the outermost layers of your skin, okay? Um, it, it makes them smaller. Okay, so when this happens, it impairs the blood flow to your skin. Okay, so your skin isn't getting a lot of the, um, the essential nutrition that you're putting into your body. It's not able to get through. It's not able to get oxygen that it requires. Okay, so um, you lose vitamin A. You lose a lot of nutrition that your skin needs to be more elastic and whatnot. And so as a result, skin-wise, just skin alone, um, smoking will cause it to sag and wrinkle, especially 
at a very early age, just because um, the more you do it, the less oxygen you're able to get to your skin, okay? And the less um, nutrition and whatnot that goes into your skin. And that's just what nicotine does. Um, so the more is in there, the more that will happen. Um, not necessary. it's not just um, for the skin though. Think about it, if it's going to narrow your blood vessels, especially in the outermost layer. So if it narrows your blood vessels, that's going to affect all your other organs as well. Okay, so anyway, um, in older people, um, in older people, um, smoking reduces your bone density and especially in postmenopausal women, it increases the risk of hip fractures, it increases risk of cataracts, it's going to increase the risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, okay? And quitting smoking is going to decrease these risks. Of course, the sooner you quit, the sooner the better, the more um, life you may expect to gain back. Um, okay, moving forward. So genetic and acquired diseases. Um, the more diseases of an individual or an individual has and the number of body systems affected, the more likely they are to die, right? Um, <clears throat> there are many mutations and genes that are passed from mother to child, and this can increase the rates of aging later on in life, okay? And it may not happen early, but um, genetic diseases can hit you much later on in life and it'll seriously affect the rate at which you age um, and all of that. Um, so anyways, some genetic diseases um, affect life expectancy, especially from the very beginning. And some examples of that might be Down syndrome, Huntington's disease, and things like that. Also some acquired diseases will also affect um, an individual's life expectancy. The more diseases you have, the more um, the more tissues are going to be affected and be deteriorating more. So it will accelerate um, the aging process and the more likely you will to have a shorter lifespan or a shorter life expectancy, right? So some acquired diseases that would affect you would be cancer, um, any kind of heart disease, high cholesterol, obesity, stuff like that. Um, okay, so body weight and height. Um, weight gain in early adulthood through midlife is related to increases in both fat and muscle mass, right? And we kind of already know that, but weight loss at an older age is associated with a higher risk for a disproportionate decline in muscle mass. Okay. Um, typically, okay, obesity itself is correlated with an increased risk of premature death and disability. Um, So physical activity. Physical activity is essential to your physical, your cognitive, okay, and your social functioning, um, just as well to your overall health, okay? Um, so physical activity might be the primary factor for promoting um, optimal aging. Cognitive function has been found to be affected by nutrition in that malnutrition can cause long-term cognitive impairment, okay? So eating healthy, getting your exercise in, this can all be probably one of like the main things that's going to help you with aging, promoting optimal aging, right? Um, high levels of physical activity are definitely associated with low death rates from all causes of mortality. Okay, exercise has been shown to strengthen heart, the heart, okay, um, 
it decreases the, your likelihood of becoming obese or at least helps you lose weight so you're less you know obese um, it increases good cholesterol in the blood lowers your LDLs your bad cholesterol um, Although no study has conclusively documented the effect of physical activity or the type, the frequency, the duration, which promote long life, um, it's just common knowledge at this point, and we just, we can, it has, um, physical activity has clearly shown huge results in um, overall health, not just in the older adults in everyone okay so alcohol use okay so alcohol what alcohol does to you is it depletes your body of vitamin a okay also dehydrates you um vitamin a is actually it plays a huge role in keeping your skin firm and youthful okay so a huge thing of a major thing that alcohol does in, I guess, the appearance of aging, okay, um, is it's going to um, have, it's going to damage your skin or have your skin age a lot faster. And also you, it damages your eyes, okay? So drinking a lot is going to cause um, irritation of the blood vessels in our eyes, okay? And this is why we see a lot of people who clearly drink a lot um, might have like bloodshot eyes and their eyes look really heavy and you might see like gigantic bags just like it's almost like a fold that's like over their like in their eye under eye area um, that's what it does that's generally what it does and it's because of like what it does to your blood vessels um, so anyway Light consumption, which is like one or two drinks a day, may be associated with some cardiovascular benefits, but this is typically with red wine, okay? It, it really, uh, it's usually, or what we have seen in a lot of like our common culture and just common um, information that gets thrown around out there, usually they do say that just light consumption of maybe red wine is fine one to two drinks a day and it may actually improve your heart condition and they tend to have a lot of antioxidants and things like that however heavy drinking is going to uh, reduce your life expectancy okay um, all right moving forward so marital status so some older adult couples have been married or they've been in a committed relationship for decades, whereas others may have just become a couple later on in life, okay? So many couples that have stayed together into old age experience and have a lot of experience together, and they have overcome many obstacles throughout their life, many crises along the way and things like that. Um, so they have a deep connection, right? Um, and one of the hardest hurdles for a couple is the transition into retirement. But when you have someone to transition into retirement and into old age with, and you have that, um, that support, it, um, helps with the aging process. Um, for a lot of people having, um, a, having some, a partner, a lifetime partner with them, this, um, yeah, this really helps promote aging in a very positive way because this is going to be a time when there's going to be a lot of deep soul searching and going down that journey with your partner is just going to contribute to the overall wellness and health of that individual. Um, married people um, <clears throat> at the time of their deaths usually live a lot longer than those who have been divorced or widowed. Okay, so married people, married people that are able to stick together, they usually tend to live a whole lot longer. Uh, marriage can help promote longevity because you have a friend to help you cope with everything. All, you know, it can help reduce your stress, make you feel more grounded and secure and all of that. It promotes healthful habits. Many times um, partners will check each other. Okay, you, 
you notice your partner doing something that is that is um, destructive or might damage something themselves or something going on in the home or in the family structure or whatever, um, and, and you you get them to stop. Okay, so you can promote um, healthy habits with your partner. Okay, and things like that. So moving on to psychological factors. So healthy aging um, includes physical, psychological, social, spiritual well-being overall. So psychological factors are part of healthy aging. Um, and personality traits may influence longevity. Okay, so if you have like a negative personality, um, this might lead to high blood pressure, terrible attitude, um, things like that. Um, a negative, someone who has a really negative personality, they might choose a lot of life shortening type behaviors. Some examples of that could be um, just abusing, um, abusing anything really, abusing drugs, cigarette smoking, alcohol, or anything else that you can abuse, right? Um, and then someone who's more calm, a person who might be more positive and, you know, joyful and things like that and smile for no reason and all that, they would more likely have more of like a nice calm personality. Um, they're probably going to have um, stronger immune systems in um, cholesterol levels, not high blood pressure, um, and things like that. So definitely your um, outlook on life and your thoughts definitely is going to contribute to uh, what's going on on the inside, okay? Because that's going to sort of regulate your hormones in one way, which will also... <laughs> You know, it's going to manifest in a lot of different ways, including what's, you know, going on in the inside. Okay. So, moving forward, social class, education, income, and occupation. Okay. So, social economic status has been found to affect psychological health, the psychological health of um, older adults. Okay, so poverty, poverty is considered a risk factor for declines in mental health among older adults and those that are at lo lower levels of socioeconomic status are often most likely to be diagnosed with a psychological disorder and things like that. Um, high educated, highly educated people, higher occupational levels and whatnot tend to have longer life, longer prosperity, less health problems. And then those who those who are in like the middle and upper classes, same thing, they tend to have, um, you know, longer life, less health problems as they age. And then um, <laughs> so, and then those who are in lower socioeconomic statuses tend to not be as educated they um, may not be spending much, they might not have much money and they're not going to spend it on um, health and better living conditions. They're more thinking in terms of survival. Um, so usually what we're seeing is that when people are in more of like the higher or middle or upper middle classes, they'll tend to spend a lot more money on their health care. They're going to spend more money on um, or they're going to take more time to like learn and about what is healthy, what may contribute to their well-being, their overall health. Um, they might be higher, um, highly educated individuals. They're going to have more healthy habits and have better living conditions. Okay. Cultural factors. So. People from developed countries tend to have higher life expectancy than those from developing countries. Okay, so, um, which we're definitely seeing. Um, look in the life, look at the life expectancy of those individuals living in the United States compared to those who live in other countries. 
Okay, if you were to compare life expectancy, you would see, well, like I already said, America is the highest, has the highest life expectancy. Um, so we would definitely, anyone, any developing country would definitely have a much lower um, life expectancy than those who live here. Um, so um, a lot of factors that may contribute to this might be associated with high rates of infant and maternal mortality, um, sanitation, uh, prevalence of infectious diseases, dietary factors, access to health care, and all of that. All of that's going to affect um, longevity. Um, okay, so the physical environment. All right, so environmental factors that accelerate the aging process are those that influence or are influence either the damage of cellular macromolecules or interfere with their repair. Okay, so you're either damaging your cells or you're interfering with our cellular repair. Okay, and so some of those might be chronic inflammation, chronic infection, um, metallic chemicals that are coming around, uh, radiation, UV lights, and of any other thing that is going to heighten oxidative stress, okay, would um, be part of the physical environment that is going to affect the aging process. Okay, so air pollution is definitely going to um, affect longevity. Okay, um, radiation, of course, and the polluted anything that kind of really pollutes the environment or anything that puts radiation um, or, you know, like I said, anything that contributes to um, heighten the oxidative stress out there, anything that um, interferes with repair or actually damages a cell. Um, okay, so biological theories of aging. Um, so physiological changes occur with aging in all organ systems, right? So lean body mass will decline with age, which is primarily due to the loss and atrophy of muscles. Also, degenerative changes are going to occur in the joints. Um, and all of this is going to contribute to limited mobility of older adults. Okay, um, so two phenomena that we should um, focus on about biological theories of aging would be a physiological decline in many body systems. It's so like I've just mentioned, um, our, our muscles, the atrophy of our muscles, our joints are going to decline and things like that. So focus on the physiological decline in you know, our different parts, um, and then an increased prevalence of disease, okay? Um, many, um, actually almost most of the older adults will have at least one chronic illness or do have at least one chronic illness, okay? And um, the more the aging process kicks in, more likely you will have many corbid more um, comorbidities. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> do we have a limited amount of life? Can we use it all up? So, looking at these questions, um, animal studies, there have been some animal studies that show that having a slower metabolism increases your longevity. Um, so that's actually really cool. The rate of living theory says that the faster the metabolism of an organism, the shorter its lifespan is. Okay, so we're actually kind of lucked out there. I know a lot of people are always like, oh no, our metabolism is so slow. Well, having a slower metabolism increases your longevity. Okay, um, so anyway, this study, um, 
of the study that came up with the rate of living theory was done by Max Rebner in 1908 after his observation that larger animals tend to outlive small animals and small animals are the ones who have the slow metabolism. Big animals have this, or small animals have the fast metabolism, sorry, and then big animals have the large metabolism. Okay, so theories of aging. So in summary, any single theory of aging is really insufficient, at least right now. Many generic, genetic theorists do acknowledge the um, external influences that act on the body and cause us to age and vice versa. Okay, so all, also we do have genetic um, influences that act on our body and cause us to age as well. Um, so it's really difficult to actually pinpoint exactly what is causing us to age and how do we stop certain things um, and all of that. So some attempts to extend your length of life, what you can do is um, there is caloric restriction. So you can eat a little bit less. You can um, count your calories you and things like that. Just don't, you know. Don't pile in all the food, especially food that isn't good for you, okay? And you should be able to live a lot longer. Also, antioxidant theory, therapy. Um, just take vitamins. Well, you should take vitamin or eat foods that are very rich in essential vitamins, okay? And then, of course, there's human growth hormone, but... Um, you know, many people are not going to be able to use human growth hormone. Also, is it even effective? Should we even be going down that road? Is it is it good for us? Truly, really do that. Um, anyway, 